everyone. So thanks again for joining us this afternoon for our VEF forum uh, called Navigating an Era of Unprecedented Liquidity. So my name is Andrew Schick. I'm going to be the MC for today. And uh, I am the executive director for New Ventures VC. And I'm also a VEF board member and uh, happy to be here today. So first, I'd just like to acknowledge that VEF is very grateful to be located on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. And I'd also like to acknowledge the unceded territories from where you may be watching today. All right, so for those who are new to VEF, so VEF stands for Vancouver Entrepreneurs Forum, and VEF is a nonprofit society and a networking forum for tech entrepreneurs. So VEF was founded all the way back in 1988, so 30 plus years here. And since then, VEF has been bringing together entrepreneurs and investors with the idea of cultivating meaningful connections and creating interesting conversations. We host eight events a year, and the season always starts in September and ends in June. So quick agenda for today. I'm going through the welcome right now and I've got a few more slides and thank yous to give. Then we're gonna move right into five lightning pitches from up and coming tech startups. And then we'll jump into our panel discussion on today's topic. Okay, so VEF would not be possible without the contributions of our dedicated volunteer board members. And they're all listed here too, here. Uh, thank you to our board members. They're very committed to helping advance Vancouver's tech ecosystem. As you can see, we've got a fantastic list here. It really does take a village to run a nonprofit organization here. So uh, thank you to everyone. Uh, also a special thank you. We've actually have some outgoing uh, board members who have completed their terms. So thank you to Leslie Esford, Peter Holgate, Raj Handel, Syed Hassan, and Taya Nicola. And a warm welcome to our new board members who just joined, Lindsay Chan, Melanie Campbell, Michelle Sklar, and Shivam Kishore. So welcome and thank you. Okay, uh, very important is to thank our supporters. So VEF's season presenting sponsor is TELUS Ventures. Thank you, TELUS Ventures, for all the support and to the entire team there. We also have a whole bunch of other great sponsors here. So CIBC, Douglas, Corporate Recruiters, Vantage Capital, Faskin, Silicon Valley Bank, Entrepreneurship at UBC, and our media sponsor, Vancouver Tech Journal. Uh, it's because of all these supporters that we're able to offer free and discounted tickets during uh, this time of hybrid events as we hopefully, fingers crossed, exit uh, these, these COVID events. Um, but we have also had the option for uh, kind of a pay what you can model and many of you attending have generously paid for tickets to attend the event and thank you very much for that as well. The support really does make a difference for for the year. Uh, like I said, I'm from New Ventures BC, and New Ventures BC is also a delivery partner for VEF. So that means we we partner with VEF to uh, to uh, create these events. Uh, and to learn more about us and our annual uh, tech startup competition, please visit us at newventuresbc.com. If you hear anything interesting today, here are all of our multitude of social media channels. Please give us a tag and let us know what, what you thought. And now I wanna make sure we have lots of time for our lightning pitches. So it's kind of coincidental here that we've got five great lightning pitches and these are 100 second pitches from promising tech companies. And they all happen to be uh, top 10 companies in this year's New Ventures BC competition. So kind of a nice little overlap there between me and, and VEF. So our first lightning pitch is pocketed and Brianna Blaney is here to uh, pitch. So I'm going to just uh, stop sharing here and uh, let Brianna take it from here. Awesome, thanks so much, Angie. Thrilled to be here. Here with me while I just share my screen. Okay, access to funding is a leading barrier to entrepreneurship and innovation. As founders ourselves, we experience this frustration directly. My name is Brianna Blaney, and we built Pocketed to help startups and small businesses across North America easily access billions of dollars every year in grants, tax credits, and other business incentive programs. We did this with our intelligent matching platform and our managed marketplace. We launched Pocketed with a clear vision to give entrepreneurs the power to build businesses without financial barriers. 
Today, more than 3,000 businesses across North America use Pocketed to successfully access non-dilutive funding. When a company creates a Pocketed account, they tell us a bit about their business. Based on their business profile, our algorithms automatically match them with programs, grants, tax credits that they're eligible for. But our users don't just want information. They want money in the bank. And this is what Pocketed does differently and really well. We help our users successfully apply to programs through our managed marketplace, connecting them with the right grant writers, tax credit consultants, and other service providers to be successful. We make money through transaction fees in our marketplace and SaaS revenue from our premium tier. In the last 90 days alone, we've helped our users secure more than $5 million in grant funding to grow their businesses. We just closed our oversubscribed seed financing round and are scaling rapidly across North America. To end with an ask, we would love to welcome you to Pocketed. You can create a free Pocketed account today and use the referral code VEF2021 to access exclusive benefits. Thank you. Awesome, thank you, Brianna. I think you had five seconds to spare, so well-timed. Okay, next up is Sean from Metador.com. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Sean. I'm one of the co-founder at Matador. Um, so whenever there's any sort of field work involved in the natural resource space, collaboration has always been a big issue. People are still using spreadsheets, complicated ERP system and mapping software. And often the result is pulling teeth. So what Matador is, is a project management software for projects where you need to see what's live on a map. Since our launch about 11 months ago, we have done over 120K in ARR and have started five enterprise pilots that will represent another 500K ARR within the next six months. Natural resources companies such as Petronest and GHD manage their environmental activities across hundreds if not thousands of locations. Instead of switching between spreadsheets and complicated ERP system, they just need to visualize their portfolio of project on map and zoom in on each one of them for key details such as site drawings, tasks, costs, and communications. On average, we make about 100,000 per company and with over 40,000 natural resource companies in the US and as well as across Canada, that is a $4 billion market. Our market size will grow as we expand into other industry with location-based operations such as civil engineering, agriculture, and retail. So once again, my name is Sean and this is Matador and we've recently been backed by YC and have already oversubscribed on our seed round. But if you would love to get in contact, we're planning our next round uh, somewhere in Q2 of next year. So here's my email and we'd love to get in touch. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Sean. And for any, if you're a startup wondering about how to get into YC one day, the Vancouver Tech Journal did this really great article with Matador on about that process. So definitely a great read. Okay, next up, Moment Energy and Samreen is here. A moment. Hi, thanks for having me. I'm setting up my screen here. Alrighty. Hi, everyone. My name is Samreen. I'm a co founder and COO at Moment Energy. With recent talk on renewables and electric vehicles, it's easy to forget that fossil fuels still supply 84% of world energy, with North America included as a large culprit. In particular, remote areas across North America rely heavily on diesel generators to meet their power needs. Energy storage can help them transition to clean, efficient, and reliable power, but existing solutions are too costly. Energy storage can also help commercial and industrial facilities save on hundreds of thousands in operational costs. And this is where we come in. Moment provides clean, affordable, and reliable energy storage by repurposing retired electric vehicle batteries. We use EV batteries because they still have an average of 80% of capacity remaining when they're retired from the car. Our competitive advantage breaks down into price, performance, and sustainability, where we sell our systems at two-thirds the price of existing lithium ion battery solutions. And we're also developing our own proprietary battery management system. Where we have a series of pilot projects deployed across Canada, and here is an example of our portfolio. And right now we have a pipeline of $1.2 million of letters in letters of intent and negotiations. We're partnered with major automakers, including Nissan North America. And this year we were named the top impact startup in Canada and the top three for NVBC. We recently closed our $3.5 million seed raise, but would love to keep in touch with interested investors for our series A. And here is my contact information. Thanks so much for listening. Awesome, thank you, Sunreen. And congratulations on the raise that you just closed. Thank you. 
All right. Okay, so I'm going to get you to stop sharing and we will now welcome to the stage Brett from Streamline Athletes. Okay, it looks like my screen share is working here. Hey, everybody. We are Streamline Athletes. I have my logo here on the shirt. We're a data driven sports recruiting platform uh, for both student athletes and for the collegiate teams that are recruiting those athletes. And what makes us unique is that we're a two-sided model that's servicing both sides rather than just one, and that we were built by former collegiate student athletes who really understand the space that we're in. Our problem, while not simple to solve, is simple to explain. Recruiting for both the student athletes and for the collegiate teams is expensive and it's time consuming. And the solutions that our audience is currently using are really ineffective. But with Streamline Athletes, the solution saves collegiate teams 80% of the time and money that they're spending on recruiting. And for athletes, we provide the tools and the data that they need to create an athlete profile, have their athletic and academic, academic data verified, filter through over 1,700 different schools and contact coaches right from the platform. In terms of traction, we have over 60 paid B2B clients. These are college and uh, university sports teams. Um, we have 155% revenue renewal year over year from them, over 4,500 athletes on the platform. And we're on pace to do $20,000 in monthly recurring revenue by the end of our fiscal year at the end of this June. In terms of next steps and where we are today, we are currently raising our seed round, which is just opening. It's $1.2 million. And this is for expanding to new sports markets and scaling our technology to multiple sports. So my ask for you today is to be in touch with me. My email address is brett at streamlineathletes.com if you'd like to chat about sports and how we're solving problems in the collegiate sports space. And uh, of course, about where we plan to go with the company and our investment round. Thanks so much for your time. And I look forward to hearing from anybody who's interested to chat. Awesome, thanks, Brett. Uh, I'd suggest, you, why don't you put your email address on the website in the chat so people can uh, easily get in touch with you. I will do that. Thanks, awesome. Angie. Thank you. Okay. And our fifth pitch of the day and our last one of the day is Andrew from Train Fitness. Awesome. Thanks, Angie. Uh, so yeah, my name is Andrew. I'm one of the co-founders of Train Fitness. Uh, Train Fitness is the first application that can automatically track, record, and analyze your entire strength-based workout hands-free using only the motion of your wrist and an Apple Watch. So whether that's sit-ups, pull-ups, squats, bicep curls, and even detecting the differences in equipment, for example, between a barbell bench press and a dumbbell bench press, our patented artificial intelligence algorithms are able to detect these different exercises, count your reps, and log your entire workout hands-free. Um, Aside from Train Fitness, there's currently no solutions that do this right now. Users are required to either manually log their strength or anaerobic-based workout or forgo logging altogether. On top of this exercise tracking and rep recording, we've also built a social platform where users can like, comment, share, and engage in a, a digital community across all things anaerobic exercise. Train Fitness is essentially doing what Strava, Peloton, Fitbit, Whoop, and so many others have brought to the cardio space. We're looking to try and bring that to the anaerobic space to build a digital community for strength training. Currently, our app detects over 80 exercises at 95% accuracy, and we're looking to bring this to over 200 different exercises at 99% accuracy within the next six months. We launched September 15th, and we've had already 3,500 downloads in the last nine weeks alone. Uh, currently, there's 10 million strength workouts happening each day, and we want to try and bring digital tracking and recording to each of these individual workouts. I'll post my uh, email address in the chat uh, below so you guys can get in touch if you'd like, as well as our website, um, and we'll look forward to hearing from you. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Andrew. And uh, I have seen the demo, and it's very impressive, and the tech works. So please definitely go check it out. Thank okay. You. So I'm going to just reshare here and we'll get started. Hold on one sec. Okay. Okay. Here we go. All right. So thanks again to our five excellent lightning pitchers. And uh, I believe uh, we've got lots of info on them in the chat if you want to get in touch. So moving on now, we've got a really great panel. 
And I'm going to now pass it over to the moderator of the panel, who's also a, a board member at VEF and also the director of technology banking uh, for Western Canada at Silicon Valley Bank. So Katarina, over to you. Thank you. I'm super excited to be here to moderate this panel. Um, I'll introduce the panel in no particular order. We'll start with Eric uh, Bukovinsky with the L-Town Partners, Judy Hess, at, uh, CEO of Copperleaf. We've got Hughes Lelenset from Inovia, Chris Newman at Panache, and Jay Ryan from Rhino. So as you can probably imagine with this heavy hitting panel, we could spend probably the entire session talking about their credentials and bios, but we're not gonna do that. Instead, we've decided to just link to their um, LinkedIn or corporate websites in the chat, and you can check them out um, at your own leisure. So is everybody ready? I don't know if we're all, all the presenters are in the, in the room. Yeah, we're all good. Yeah. Perfect. Um, okay, well, let's start off, um, get right into it. Uh, we'll start with maybe an easy one. We know that 2021 has been a pretty wild year, um, to say the least. So many incredible successes, huge announcements um, in the tech space in Vancouver and, and more broadly. So maybe we could just go around um, and start off with just from your perspective, kind of where, uh, where you sit, how did you see the venture landscape in Vancouver change in 2021 versus previous years? Like what's sort of standing out to you? Maybe we start with Eric. I was gonna say when you pick on one of us first, it's usually the easiest way to kind of get people chatting. Um, uh, thank you first off uh, for having me here today. Appreciate the opportunity to uh, share my thoughts or hopefully we'll get this kind of nice and controversial. We'll get people chatting a little bit, get some good controversy going. Oh, or maybe not, we'll see what happens. Um, so what, what, is, uh, what, what is unique about the Vancouver uh, uh, ecosystem? So I'm, I'm gonna go off and say, I actually don't think a lot's changed. What we've had happen is you go through these cycles and you get a recognition of, of what, um, what a lot of great things that were have been going on over the course of many years here in this ecosystem and that uh, what's kind of happened in kind of this consolidation effect is we get to see you know kind of the culmination of work that's been underway for you know years and sometimes even you know potentially decades here um, in uh, in this area and you know I think the if you look at kind of a, kind of a cycle here you we've had periods of time where you know financing is often the thing that tends to grab the headlines but if you actually look at the underlying development of what's been happening at the companies they've been there the entire time and uh, it's great kudos to get that recognition with the financing that's just one aspect of a lot of the businesses and um, I think Vancouver's always been a very very strong location and a lot of heads down companies it's we've just seen this spot to to uh, kind of you know puff our chests out and, and show off on uh, a few of them, some of which who are who are on the uh, uh, the panel here today, um, and knowing myself, knowing the hard work that a lot of them have been involved on uh, with with Judy uh, as well um, over the years. So um, I'll I'll open with that. Perfect. Thanks, Eric. Judy, what do you think? What as far as this year versus previous? Well, you know, it's probably some kind of continuum. Uh, but one thing that I would say from my perspective, having uh, had uh, done an IPO this year, is the interest that you can find in the US for Canadian tech stories. Um, I, I don't think I've really noticed that as much in the past, um, but there are a lot, there are a lot of um, US investors, certainly in uh, public stocks um, in particular, uh, but but even private as well, or or PEs or whatever that are very interested, more interested than I remember, let's say five or ten years ago, in Canadian tech stories that are misunderstood or underappreciated, um, and you hear that quite a bit. Um, when uh, when we did our IPO, um, our lead left uh, underwriter was Bank of America, and we particularly did that, and, and we had. Uh, BMO as well as William Blair, but so two U.S. banks and one Canadian bank, um, and there was a lot of interest from U.S. investors in Canadian tech stories, and uh, they haven't heard like many didn't hadn't even heard of Copperleaf at all 
Um, actually, most people haven't heard of the copper leaf at all. So we're a, a very good uh, secret uh, tech story. Um, but um, it's just very interesting. And I think that the Vancouver community is part of that interest. Um, obviously Toronto and maybe Waterloo and maybe some other ones as well, but definitely Vancouver. So, so that's a new thing to me from my perspective. Yeah, congrats on that IPO, uh, Judy, by the way, maybe if I, I can uh, segue that, I, I, you know, first off, it's, it's great to see Vancouver faces again. Um, uh, I would say that Vancouver is, is a fundamentally different place than even five years ago. Um, I do feel like the game has changed, you know, competition for, for capital and talent is really coming from everywhere, um, not just from across the street. And so everyone knows that um, employees can now work from everywhere, uh, but it's the same with, with investors, right? Um, that, that can deploy without the need for being in person. Um, and the implications are, are kind of really interesting. You know, for, for entrepreneur, I think it's never been a better time to raise capital as CEO. Um, but it's also never been a worse time to try to attract talent and customers. And so a big trend we're seeing are the burn rates you know, going up as a result of this kind of, <clears throat> excuse me, the generational experiment that we're going through with, with massive market opportunities. Uh, but overall, I think a, a higher risk environment, but definitely um, I think Vancouver is now a global ecosystem for sure. Jay? Yeah, I, I um, don't have a lot of new insights here the, what resonates most of what's been said already is what Eric was touch, talking about is that this was like a coming out year for Vancouver in a lot of ways that is the culmination of five plus 10 plus years of effort that's gone into this ecosystem that I think if the people present in the ecosystem always knew there were the copper leaves the true use the think epics that were out there but it wasn't recognized on a more global stage. So, so to Judy's point, American investors, I've never received more inbound from growth equity firms and from bankers pitching all kinds of companies in our portfolio to go public. It's, it's amazing just the relevance that I think Vancouver has now on that international stage. Five years ago, roll back the clock to like when we first got it started six years ago, it was a contrarian perspective to say you can build a fund focused on backing exclusively Vancouver-based companies and there's world-class businesses to be built in this ecosystem and can scale beyond just selling for scrap metal at a $100 million valuation or something. That was a, a contrarian perspective six years ago, and now it's turned, I think, completely consensus. So we've gone through over the last, you know, call it a couple of years, this transformation of a contrarian bet on Vancouver to now being a consensus bet that it's a world-class ecosystem. Awesome. Yeah, and Chris, any, any thoughts to add? Yeah, I guess I come at this from a little bit of a different perspective, being the guy who moved back to Vancouver after about 20 years in the Bay. Um, so, you know, I've been watching the city from, from the outside, and, and I think everything that's said here absolutely captures the outsider perspective, which is, you know, three, five years ago, uh, I couldn't find any VCs in San Francisco who had any interest or had even talked to a Vancouver company. You know, that was very much the outlier. And I think one of the things that you can see, you know, beyond the, the local successes is the sheer rate at which American investors are pouring capital now into Vancouver companies. And I'll have calls. I was down in San Francisco last week. Almost every investor I talked to said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I just talked to such and such company up in Vancouver. Oh, yeah. I'm, you know, we're looking at this company. And that is something that never, ever before happened. And I'm still kind of with my head on a bit of a swivel trying to trying to get used to that. Um, but I think it's a fantastic testament to all of the people on this call and, you know, including the panelists and all the attendees. And I'm just kind of parachuting back in uh, going, wow, this is nothing like the city that I left, you know, 20 years ago. And this is absolutely amazing. Awesome. It kind of also sort of brings up the thought, like, you know, if all this additional capital is pouring into Vancouver, how is this affecting how companies are valued? How are the investors on the call? Um, handling that or responding to that? Are you sort of holding your ground? Are you going with the flow? Like, um, like how have valuations changed over the last little while, just given the influx and in capital coming in? And feel free to jump in. I don't want to pick on anyone specifically. Yeah, maybe I, I can, um, I can jump in like the, um, 
It's interesting. Like the valuation, I feel like in the current state of the markets right now are less about you know the business itself, but more is in, in terms of looking at the value of the category. Um, and from that perspective, I, I, I do just want to rehash how great of an environment it is to, to be an entrepreneur and, and raising in, in this market. Um, but I, I would say that you know, category dominance and, and momentum are probably increasingly top of mind. Um, and you know, some companies are now leveraging capital um, it, as a way to, uh, to disrupt other companies. And so I think having that external pulse um, you know, on your competitor is more important than ever, um, especially those that, that seem to attract, you know, those larger rounds um, and, and use it as a competitive advantage to grow faster. Yeah, I think that's well said. Um, you know, and I think you, one of the things when, when you, you, you have this opportunity with, you know, kind of a boost in supply, you know, one of the biggest consistent things, if you ever look at venture financing, it's not necessarily in Vancouver or just generally speaking across any ecosystem in any global environment over any longitudinal time period, the biggest, con the biggest point of consistency is typically how much company is sold as a percentage, you know, percentage of that company sold in a given stage of a financing. And what you're just seeing here is, you know, it's consistently, let's say, hey, you know, previously I would struggle to go raise $2 million and get a pre-money uh, 8 million, sell 20% of my company. Now it's like, okay, I can go get 20, get a pre-money 80 and, uh, and, and, and go make it work. So it's more about can, you know, is the market opportunity there, the deployment of capital there, the money's out there to go get. Um, if you can tell those stories, and I think it's reflected in the valuation, I think, and, it, and it's somewhat separate of, I think, the underlying business fundamentals um, and, you know, uh, it, it, it's not, it can be grounded, but it's not necessarily specifically tied to the underlying business fundamentals as, 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 as he was saying. Yeah. I mean, I, I'd add just a few things. I think, so speaking from the position of like the very earliest of stages where we operate, so pre-seed seed and, you know, early series A deals, I think what we're seeing is that the round sizes are getting larger, the geographic borders and restrictions are being removed. So people are participating in C deals from anywhere in the world. Zoom deals are, are now the, uh, the norm, not the exception. And I think that something that uh, <clears throat> uh, was mentioned earlier, I forget by which panel, is that the cost structure of both the talent side of things as well as the go-to-market side is so changed that it's re you require a you know three to five million dollar seed round to actually achieve that you know, potential for category domination, potential for category creation that that next round of investor is going to look at and over-index to in terms of the ability to raise capital. So I think that cost structure has uh, permeated into that like early stage financing. And one thing, you know, I know Eric said that he wanted this to be a controversial panel, so I'll, I'll toss a little jab at my growth equity pals over here. But the, like, I think the other uh, elephant, or I should say tiger in the room is that if you're not getting tigered, you are scared of a tiger-like situation for these category-defining companies. And that is having a dramatic push and pull, I think, on a whole bunch of different people in terms of the willingness to pay, the necessity to pay to play at that particular stage. Otherwise, you're relegated to a part of the market that is not those category-defining companies. It's not that top right magic quadrant kind of player. So that's, uh, I think, an overall something that's uh, seeped into specifically the later stages of the market and is, and is definitely coming down market. And, and I'll maybe add one last uh, point on top of what Jay said. For the founders that are on the call, a lot of people don't realize the degree to which valuation is driven by competition amongst VCs. And so historically, it, not only in Canada, but basically every ecosystem outside of the US for most founders at the pre-seed and seed, their only options are domestic. If you're a Canadian company, you can get Canadian investors. If you're a UK company, you get UK investors. That lack of competition tends to put a bit of a ceiling on the valuation. Now that we've got global funding, as, as Jay pointed out, we've got folks from all over the world trying to invest. Suddenly there's more capital, founders have more options, and that leads to a whole change of the dynamics around valuation, around terms, board composition, and puts a significantly more... Uh, significantly larger amount of power in the hands of the founders than I think they've ever had before. What about like factoring in the next round? You know, like how is this all going to play out? Like in the next round, if 
there's bigger, bigger dollars, bigger expectations. What, like any thoughts around some of the risks around taking as much money as is thrown at you? Well, I, I think I do want to, I mean, we, we touched on, I think, just the general supply point. Um, but you know, there's another thing that goes on, you know, capital or, or subcategories within capital don't act in isolation, right? They're all relative to each other. And so what, what, what I think we're kind of identifying here as, you know, even within, say, the, the particular, you know, venture capital uh, specific types, you, know, you, know, you talk about seed, you can talk about early, you can talk about mid-stage growth, you can talk about late stage growth, you can talk about platform and expansion and all these varying types of things. What's fundamentally happened, and even beyond venture and into other types of growth equity, other types of private equity, um, even public equity um, exposure seeking out, you can look at debt, we can even go <laughs> like you, know, you can see from the debt side of things. What's very happened is that there's been a shift out in terms of risk exposure kind of across the spectrum and and all these capital classes. And what what ends up happening is that, you know, if you're observing a uh, certain behavior with uh, you know within a subcategory, odds are the other behaviors are going on in the other categories. You may not be there yet, but it's it uh, it is ultimately going on. Yeah, I, I, yes. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Julia. So you're oh, on sorry, I was just going to say, you know, you talked about, you know, should you take all the money that was thrown at you? So it's kind of interesting because usually when you need money, uh, it's hard to get. And when you don't need money, it's easier to get as usual, like the classic. So just if I look at Copperleaf, you know, we raised about seven, eight million in 2010. And then we didn't really raise any more money until like 2019 when one of our, our customers wanted to invest in us. And we took this as a strategic investment. And back then, uh, early on, when we were raising money, um, you know, at first we thought, okay, we'll raise 3 million or something like that. In the end, we could get over 7 million just because of the way it went. And, and my philosophy is if you can get it, take it. Um, because you never know what can happen and the market can close the next day for some unknown for some unknown reason but as well when you do negotiate those deals with all these other people that are on the call not me <laughs> um, you have to make sure that the clauses and the things that you put in especially if there's a down round or how that dilution is going to trigger and work you need to really work carefully on what that looks like going forward because you could end up in a very difficult situation um, if you have, you know, full ratchet anti-dilution, double dipping, all these things I'm sure everyone's aware of. Um, but you you need to really un understand that because if you ever have a down round, you you it will be an, a terribly nasty experience. So so of course, how much money can you get? What is that valuation? Some of the risks can can at least be that when you're looking out. Um, but as I said, my philosophy was at the beginning when to take more money than we, we anticipated, because that will give us more of a cushion so we can grow into that category leader so that we can drive that and we have a bit of cushion to operate as a business. Because, um, you know, things, things go up, things go down, lots of things can happen. So I just think that's a, one thing to think about if you're, if you're in this uh, you know, raising money and what, what this round and the next round is going to end up, uh, uh, what's going to happen to you going forward and trying to anticipate that in a way that makes sense for you. Yeah, I think on that point, like for, from my perspective, if I'm an entrepreneur, like what's exciting to me is that there's just an incredible amount of tools now to get to category dominance and, and grow even faster. Um, and I think it's important to understand like the audience and, and the breadth of investor, not just VCs, but, you know, crossover hedge funds, you know, pension systems that are now trickling downstream. Um, and they each come with very different set of expectations. And, you know, Jay hinted at Tiger Global, which has been capturing a lot of the, you know, the, the news lately. Um, I do think we're, we're entering the second inning where it's going to be very interesting to see the type of signaling that you know they're going to think about across their portfolio for the follow-on rounds, given how you know distributed they are. So, just be mindful of the trade-offs um, of of the type of investor. At the end of the day, I'd say that you know building a great business is, is what drives value still in this market. It's just the number of tool um, available has just increased drastically. So be aware of that as a founder. 
Awesome. Um, maybe we'll turn to another theme that we've noticed, which is lots more IPOs than I think we've seen here um, in recent years. Judy, you're obviously a huge success story in that um, in that group, and congratulations on that. Why do like why is now the time that we're seeing more IPOs in Vancouver? Do you have any kind of thoughts? Is it just a coincidence, or what's sort of driving that? Well, I just think the public market is valuing companies very highly. It's 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 a fantastic time um, to to take a company public. Really, if you look at this year. Um, who knows what will happen with Omicron and all, all this new variants and all this kind of stuff. It's always a bit of a challenge there. You never know what can happen. Um, but, you know, while the market is open and while the market is available, um, I would say that the, the valuations that the public market is giving companies, um, you know, the right companies um, is, is a really, you know, fantastic. So I think that's bringing a lot of people into the market. I, I think it kind of started a while ago with this SPAC idea and started getting a lot more people interested in going public uh, in the kind of SPAC reverse takeover mode for a while there. Um, but, you know, I think that um, the IPO market is just, you know, very, very nice valuations, great opportunities. Um, you know, and, and I, I think if, if people can access that, um, that, that's an awesome thing to do uh, at the current time. And, and you don't know how long the market will be uh, available for that, obviously. How, how do you know, like, if your company is ready or if you're the right type of company for that, uh, you know, for an IPO, like, what are sort of the signals that you would kind of look out for as an entrepreneur? Well, I would say you have no idea if you're ready to go public. <laughs> it's a very, very hard thing to understand and know. I mean, sure, there's some rules of the road in terms of, um, you know, how how big you are, how much revenue you have, your growth trajectory, the market you're attacking, how big is it, you know, and all these, these classic things. But to be able to say, I mean, so many people asked me um, when we were putting this process together this year, starting kind of in March, to decide if we wanted to take the company public or not, they kept saying to me, you know, do you think you're ready to go public? <laughs> it's like, how would we know? <laughs> we don't know what we don't know. Um, so um, in the end, you know, I mean, you have a syndicate, you know, you have people that are helping you, advising you, you're talking to a lot of different banks before you pick your syndicate. Obviously that's a critical point in picking the right syndicate, I think that works with you and can make the right decisions. But um, I always think of it kind of like, you know, um, before you have a child, uh, you think you might know what it might be like to have a child, but actually you don't know <laughs> until you get one. <laughs> and then it's like, wow, I have to look after this for the rest of my life. Wow, that's a, that's a transition. And I don't think you can imagine it until you do it. And I think it's kind of a little bit like that with, um, with an IPO. So if you have the right parameters, you have the right syndicate, um, you know, you'll find out what it's like and to see whether whether you were ready or not, or if it made sense or not, you'll find that out as you go. But it's very hard to understand what it will be like uh, until you do it. Very cool. <laughs> so you're saying I can't give back my kids? <laughs> Any other IPO thoughts, Hughes? Yeah. I, <clears throat> sorry, you want to go ahead, Hughes? Yeah, maybe I, I just want to, Judy may, makes it sound really easy, but I think you can read the, the right points. You know, I, I saw someone joking around about writing a, an IPO preparedness blog after raising a series A. I, I do think, you know, there's <laughs> there's a lot of noise. Um, one one piece we feel is, is the critical path is, is really about um, predictability of revenue, and that comes from both team and, and technology. Um, and having that ability to really hit the targets, because um, I think once you're a public company, remember that if, if you do miss your forecast, you know, you, you risk losing a lot of your market cap. And I think a key point in, in what Judy mentioned, like the syndicate, uh, the syndicate means finding the right investor that will follow you, you know, through the ups and down versus trying to drop your stock um, at the first, you know, uh, bump down the road. And I think that 
like the, the same framework applies for fi finding these long-term partnerships, even though you're a public company, I think that's, that's critical as well. Yeah, I think that's, that's a good uh, overview. The, if we roll back the clock though, and what like kickstarted this wave of Canadian companies that went public on the TSX in particular, because there's been a, a wave of companies that have gone public on US exchanges all over the world. But if we zero in just on this Canadian tech IPO phenomenon of what's taking place over the last 12, 18 months, it was the narrative was, and I hope there's no investment bankers on the call, but the narrative was uh, for the, the bankers that would pitch this is something went well, something along the lines of there's this crazy supply and demand disconnect in the Canadian capital markets where there's this insatiable demand from all these public market institutions that have this limitation of the amount of, of TSX and Canadian companies they have to hold. And there's a real shortage of available names that they can go out there and buy. There's this incredible opportunity for you to go public on the TSX raise your what would have been your series c or d or e round your growth equity round on the tsx then follow in lightspeed's footsteps or nuve's footsteps now of do your mjds and cross list into the u.s exchange and then scale on the u.s exchange that was a long that was the short of the long that was the pitch so what ended up happening was i think this this resonated really well with companies that had long-term visions that had this kind of approach to category creation or definition that wanted to build a durable long-term company that weren't looking to sell in the near term and viewed this as like a really productive way to stay an independent company and raise capital along the way and have a currency for their share price for M&A and all that additional stuff, a big branding moment as well for talent attraction. What I think you unfortunately got as well are the companies in Canada that perhaps didn't have a private market bid and they took advantage of the market window to go public when there was a very receptive audience there. So I think you've seen a number of these smaller companies that raised smaller IPOs that were you know, typically subscaled, didn't have the predictability of their revenue model that he was talking about and have subsequently really suffered and seen, you know, they didn't meet or beat expectations. They didn't meet or keep. They like missed expectations on the first critical couple of quarters crushed all investor enthusiasm and trust in the management's execution capability. And now they're in a really tough place. And I think you're going to see some consolidation of those names and potentially even some take privates of U.S. growth equity that despite, Judy, like the healthy multiples in the Canadian capital markets, like sometimes when we talk to growth equity groups, they're like, you know, I can't get a, a insert name of a company of TSX tech company, high growth for you know half the multiple in the private market so there's this incredible disconnect of the private and public multiples and I, I think this is all good um you know I, i'm going to bring a bit of an anecdote here because I, I had a prior life before i was in canadian bc in the u.s public market space so um can can speak a bit although it was probably you know prehistoric relatively speaking uh to to the the age that we're in today um but the the the, the one thing i think what's what's often lost is you know for, first off to be candid like not all public markets are created equal and you kind of evaluate a public market by based on who are the investors and how they invest uh in you know in, in into you know the companies here and, you know, I think one of the stark differences, if you look at something uh, in the US, and I imagine I'm, I'm kind of, I'm going to throw a hypothetical out here and see if this actually fits with why, why Judy used like, um, like William Blair and B of A in the, um, uh, in the syndicate is, it, it, you know, when the, the degree of kind of subspecialization in the US and the public markets is, is pretty deep. I mean, you'll find funds, you'll find public market investors that have, you know, full analysts de dedicated to certain verticals that are looking for the <laughs> what you've talked about here, Jay's talked about, you know, what is the next category to buy or what's going to change over the guard within the space and so on and so forth. Whereas there isn't that many of them in, in Canada, uh, you know, as a whole. Um, when, uh, you know, and I'm saying that they're not there, but the, the depth of, of that, and then particularly in the technology side, there isn't that many specialized technology funds um, that, that focus exclusively in, in the TSX. There's a lot of crossover of US and, and, and Canadian guys, but uh, there isn't that many that, that are at least in relative difference to the US. Um, so, you know, at, at times, you know, your story has to be able to resonate and has to actually make sense with a party that may cover something like, hey, I'm a technology analyst, I cover BlackBerry and Shopify. 
well, those are two fundamentally different businesses that <laughs> really do two different things and probably don't actually do even do what you guys do. So um, the, uh, the, the, the sense and understanding of what that investor base is is very, very different than what is that, that, that can be what, than what's in the private market. There's very good things, but also that knowledge and that understanding of what you fundamentally do is different out there. And it's just how the, the market is structured and how the, the parties that invest um, look to deploy their capital. So in addition to the IPO trend, we're also seeing a trend in, I think, what I've noticed is a lot more secondaries more often earlier. Um, how are you sort of viewing that? Is that a factor of there's just a, an over, uh, oversubscribed round, people looking to kind of just get in and, and you know, or is it a way to um, reward the founders earlier or others? What's sort of the, the trend there? So I, I, I love secondaries, by the way, I think this is, again, one of those inflection points. You know, in the past, if you're an employee of a high growth startup, you needed to wait till you get to an IPO to really, you know, understand the value you created and monetize. Um, I think now, like, that game has changed again, like, with this influx of capital, if, you know, if you're an entrepreneur, like, as early as, you know, Series A onwards, um, it's really worth, you know, putting together a compensation committee and look at your total compensation, not just cash, but also equity, because um, the, the compensation for talent is just shifting so fast, at, you know, both on cash and equity that you almost need a space now to evaluate that much more strategically. Um, and I, I just love the idea of, of secondaries, to be honest. I think there is a fantastic tool, again, going back to the tool set. Um, that CEOs can now use to to build the uh, you know massive businesses. So, yeah, I mean, I could add just out of the copper leaf experience. So, you know, the first round we did, um, well, when I joined, um, was in 2010, um, effectively, um, and then we took this investment in 2019 from one of our uh, clients who wanted to invest in us. They had our products, and they were like, "Wow, definitely want to invest in this company." Um, given what we could do for their business. And so when we, we weren't really looking at that time for an injection of cash. So in the end, we did, um, we, we wanted the whole thing to be a secondary, uh, actually. Um, but uh, that wasn't in, in the, the ability of their funds to do that. So we did a 60% secondary and 40% to the balance sheet or treasury or whatever you want to think of it as. And that's another idea that you can do. You could, you could split it as well, right? And we had that secondary specific for, in the end, they wanted to um, have that secondary specific for employees, um, which was a really nice uh, way to do it. There's, you know, there's other things that you could do as well. Um, and so that was a, a really nice boost for the employees that many had been in the company for by that time, you know, like almost nine years. So, you know, eight, seven, eight, nine years, a lot of people had been there for a while. And that was, that was a really nice opportunity. And you don't have to have the whole thing, um, you know, as a, as a, uh, you know, a capital raise or whatever to put on your balance sheet, you can also put part of it into a secondary if, if, if possible. So it's just an idea to think about. I'll add one other thing to uh, Hugh's comment on it being a tool. You know, one of the things that I've been seeing a lot, and, and I think all of the investors here have probably been seeing, is sophisticated founders are now using secondaries as a way to swap out their early investors. So we're seeing these founders who are getting oversubscribed rounds, and they're becoming more sophisticated around which investors can I add to the table? who are gonna provide value add to help me get to the next milestone, be it a round, be it an exit, whatever the case may be. And so we're seeing these founders look at it and say, well, in the past, the only way to add to my pool of investors was to dilute myself more. But now they're going back to early investors, say angel investors, early pre-seed whatnot, and saying, hey, would you be interested in a guaranteed whatever X exit? And they're starting to increasingly swap that out as a means to really keep a focused group of investors with value add. 
Uh, and, you know, I think that's a tool that was never available before, particularly when you had sort of older school investors saying, ah, we shouldn't do secondaries. We've got to keep all the skin in the game till the end and all those sort of nonsense arguments that I think we've gotten rid of now. A great point. Yeah, that is a great point, Chris. Go, go ahead, Hugh. Oh, just that great point. <laughs> uh, well, I, I, I think what we're highlighting, what, what Chris has highlighted here, is um, it, it is exactly right. You know, it is a tool, and it, it's actually it's it's a bit of a Swiss Army knife. It's not just a hammer, right? There, there, there's a lot of different aspects in, in, in involved with um, uh, in, in uh, involved with secondaries, and and with the fact that the markets become more acceptable to it, the structures around how secondaries actually operate have become more complex and. Uh, um, and, and, you know, and, and, and more available to kind of create the, the ability to kind of match supply and demand together to, to, to kind of ultimately make it happen. You know, but the, 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 the thing is, is, you know, there is externalities with doing secondaries. Um, and I, I think it's, it's not all, uh, it, it, there can be other things that can pop up associated you know, with, uh, you know, with those things is there are implications on everything from, you know, your class base for an NA valuations on your options all the way up to uh, situations where you're readjusting how your capital stack works. And, you know, these implications can have parties that you may have maybe you have unforeseen kind of winners and losers <laughs> associated with not losers in a bad sense, but, you know, people who may be bearing some costs uh, as a part of it. Just, it's just one of the things I would recommend just if you're, if it does come up and you kind of think about it and there is some degrees of complexity associated with it, really make sure you understand what's going on with, uh, with, with, with how that they're doing. And is there, is there any additional implications associated with undertaking those secondaries? The same way you'd look at issuing a new series of stock um, uh, and, and how that would ultimately impact uh, the same type of individuals and other investors and employees in the company. Yeah, and I think another thing for, for you know, people, founders of companies to think a bit about is, you know, we're saying that we could trade out some early investors and get someone that can help us scale this business. I wonder how many times those people you bring in actually can help you scale your business. It's probably pretty hard to understand who could actually do that. Um, so you need to think about that carefully because most times these people will want a seat on the board, um, depending, I mean, it depends, right? But if you're providing that, if you, if you want these people to help scale your business, I assume you want a seat on the board or something like that, um, how do you how do you determine whether they can actually help you? I mean, I, I don't know how much I buy that story. They can help you scale, but just since this is supposed to be a little bit of a back and forth, I throw that into the crowd. <laughs> awesome. Oh, Jay, you got. Well, I, I, I wasn't going to attack that one, Judy, because I think it's a very, very good point, but I'll let that one uh, lie. I was just going to say, Chris, you know, I hope you're rethinking about selling me those shares in the company that we're co-invest in, and uh, we'll, leave, we'll leave it at that, kind of read it back to you. Perfect. Um, another trend that we're seeing or we've talked about is a lot of, you know, so you've got a lot of cash, you've raised a big round. How do you spend it? M&A um, as an option versus organic growth. It's very difficult to find talent one at a time. So, you know, growing through acquisition is an option that I'm definitely seeing a lot of companies um, take advantage of. But I guess what are the, from, from your perspectives, what are the advantages or pitfalls, risks um, in going down that route? Yeah, um, I, I, you know, again, I just think like, the topic we've touched are, are just so broad. Like, again, going at like fundraising, IPO and m and and secondaries, again, like the level of sophistication, I think is going up um, specifically on m and um, We view it as like a huge growth vector um, when it's layered on top of a strong organic growth core. Um, again, to like dominate category, like we have numerous examples in our portfolio of companies, you know, at the Series B stage that could have taken out a competitor at, at for five or ten million, and guess what? Like two to three years later, that that competitor is one one plus billion dollars. So, um, you know, we have about I would say half a dozen companies who have a, an active buy side team um, and are executing on the corp debt strategy, and that's been very, um, you know, creative, I think, from, from the perspective of just accelerating that growth. Um, so, you know, in the context of this conversation, I think m is just like 
again, another tool that you can really organize yourself um, and really execute, um, which, which again, wasn't available or perceived as positively, I think, five, 10 years ago. It used to be perceived as this kind of inorganic growth. Um, but I think that that mindset has, has completely changed now. I mean, I would definitely say from my perspective that it is very risky to do M&A. Um, and there are some ways you can de-risk it, but um, I, I've been for the last, I don't know how many years, what, I don't know, 25, 30 years, been part of buying things, selling things and selling and getting bought like the whole nine yards, right? And um, I would say the chances of you picking something uh, and buying it and understanding what you bought is, is very, very challenging. Um, the chances you're gonna get that right is, is low, uh, absolutely from my perspective. And I remember one time we had the Microsoft M&A team in to come and talk to us one time at Creo. And the amazing thing they said was, you know, 90% of what we buy doesn't turn out well at all, but the 10% takes us to the moon, and that's how it works. So imagine you're gonna do one M&A as a small company, and you have to get the, that 10%, <laughs> or at least close to that 10%. And it's very hard to understand what you're buying um, and what will happen when you buy. I mean, you know, it, it, it's just really challenging. It distracts you from your core business. So I agree with you on the fact that you need a strong organic growth to, to to, to drive that off of, um, but you really have to be careful. I think the most successful M&A things that were done um, are in my career were things that where you were either reselling that product already, or you were partnering with that company and you knew it in and out um, much better. Um, those are the things that can be successful because you kind of know that company um, and the things that can kill you very easily, let alone the technology, is just the cultural clash of bringing these companies together. It, it, it's a really a challenge. I, I've been involved in a lot of them and most of them are not, not very happy stories to be honest. So I would just be very careful um, if I was gonna go in that direction. It can be great, but there are a lot of pitfalls. Perfect. Well, thank you. We'll go through a few of the questions in the chat. There's a number of them. We're probably not going to get to all of them, but I'll just touch on maybe one or two. Um, there's a few questions around government support. Um, I think, you know, in the past, Canadian companies had a lot of government support being like a primary uh, way to fund the business in the early days. Um, now that there's other sources of capital more readily available, do you think that's going to be as important and do you think because of COVID government spending is it probably going to be clawed back are you hedging against that like any thoughts on sort of the role that government um, funding is going to play and sorry for whoever wrote the question I just kind of smushed a few together to paraphrase <laughs> I mean, it's I, I I can go here like it's it's very interesting, right? Like we um we hired um, um a CTO from from Google, and you know the stats Google has on the compensation for engineer in Canada is 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 very interesting in that I do think the idea of having access to like cheap labor is gone, and so it's really about how do you then optimize to win in a big category. Um, and, and like, yes, the, the government grants are, are one resource, but it's not something I would build a strategy around because um, it, it just doesn't feel sustainable. Um, but it's, it's important to be aware and leverage them, but it's, I, I don't think it's something that I would live or die if you want to take the, the VC back route. Um, of course, that's, it's, it's one path, right? Like you can build great bootstrap business as well. And, um, that's that's kind of how I'm thinking about it. Yeah, I, yeah. I think that's probably right. I just throw in if uh, the first company I worked for in in, in British Columbia was uh, McDonald Atwiler, and that was completely built off government money, uh, either federal or provincial or whatever. That was they they 
we did, I guess, whoever did an amazing job in building a business off of government. Um, and so that was great. I don't, I don't know that that's really something that's as available today, to be honest. I guess pocketed pocketed can help you find it back to the lightning pitch. <laughs> um, go ahead, Eric. Sorry. Oh no, I I I, I was I, I I think one one of the things if you want to be what you want to watch for I, I don't think the actual pool of money we're we're in Canada is going to actually change. Watch how it gets reallocated, and that's usually what happens when you see political changes uh, occur up at the federal level. It gets allocated differently. It doesn't actually go away. So just kind of splitting it up in a uh, in a different basket. So you know, I think what you kind of you'll see these swings for things that are a bit more egalitarian, then come back to be a bit more targeted um, toward uh, particular you know initiatives that are that are going on. And I think we're 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 seeing a swing things being more targeted now uh, in terms of that. And the, and what you might see a bit of pullback is on on the programs that are a bit more egalitarian in nature. Kind of e you know, like equal opportunity, and that's the ones where you see a little bit of risk on it. But I think some of the core tenants here aren't going anywhere uh, within Canada. Awesome. Well, so we're at time. Maybe we'll. I'll just leave it open. If anyone has any kind of final words, advice, thoughts um, they want to throw in. Uh, I mean, just to recap for me, like it is an amazing time to be an entrepreneur right now. Like the terms again, like the strategies to build big businesses are, are great bootstrap businesses, like regardless of what you're building. Um, I think the, the fact that Vancouver has really globalized and, and attracted everyone here is really a change and acknowledging that I think is, is really exciting for me, just not Vancouver, but Canada as a whole for the ecosystem. So go Vancouver and uh, go Canada. It's a very exciting time. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I'd echo that exact same point. I think, you know, the, the, what the market's telling is people are willing to underwrite risk, take a risk, and actually bring it forward. Um, like that is, I think, the the the, the key thing here. And and don't, and don't think incremental. Think think full phase shift in terms of uh, in terms of risk, because you you could potentially get it underwritten right now. And just because someone says no to you doesn't mean that you're wrong. Uh, is, uh, uh, is, is the same point. And you know, it's just what what it is is you just need more evidence. Uh, to kind of prove it out. So be be open and be willing. And and I think the market is is very open to 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 looking at uh, companies that are taking those big swings, those big uh, uh, those big opportunities, because these windows these windows kind of come and go. And now is a good time for it. I'll just jump onto what Eric said and said I'm absolutely thrilled to be back in Vancouver. This city is on fire. Be bold. Right, you know, we're talking about how investors from all over the world are coming in and trying to invest here as founders. Go where you need to go. Sky's the limit. Capital's available. You know, think beyond the city and think how you can really change the world. Because what we're seeing here is world class, world disrupting companies being built in our backyard. Jay, maybe. Sure. I mean, I don't think I have much more to add here. I'm a have been for the last six years, big cheerleader of the Vancouver tech ecosystem. So uh, and for a long time, we said there's been these sleeper picks in Vancouver that are finally having their day in the, in the sunlight and uh, super thrilled about all the momentum behind the ecosystem and echo 100% what the rest of the team here is saying of swing big, take the risk. There's lots of capital available for category defining and category shifting businesses out there. So make sure that you are taking this opportunity to, to think commensurately large and uh, all the best and thanks for tuning in. And Judy. Oh dear. Well, um, I'm I'm excited about Vancouver, of course. Um, I spent my whole career here. Um, my career spans like 38 years, starting with NDA, and there's nothing wrong with working at NDA. I would echo that comment in the chat. <laughs> I spent 14 years working at MDA, and it was a, a load of fun. Um, but um, yeah, I think people should. You know, there's a lot of opportunity here. Don't don't be. I mean, Canadians have this. We're risk averse, you know, <laughs> kind of mentality and stuff like that. I would say put that on the shelf, and uh, you know, step out. And there's a lot of opportunity that you can take advantage of here, and it's a great place to be. Other than the fact that 
you know, every atmospheric river on the planet is landing here in the last little while. Um, but other than the rain, I think we've got it made. <laughs> awesome. Well, I want to take the opportunity to thank all of the panelists for sharing their insights with us today. Um, I hope this was insightful and inspirational for the founders on the line. Hopefully you took some, some of the pointers away for your own businesses. Um, and yeah, looking forward to seeing this momentum continue in 2022 and beyond. So I'll turn it back to Angie. Thanks, everyone. All right. Thanks, Katerina, and to the panel. All right. Don't leave yet. We still have networking and uh, an announcement on our January event. But first, but first, uh, the always popular request for feedback. So um, we're just going to open a quick poll here on Zoom. And uh, if you have any feedback on just how the event went, please do share it. We really do appreciate it. While people are doing that, I will tell you that our January event will be on January 18th. So we take December off at VEF. So we'll be back in January. Uh, we'll be partnering with Deloitte once again to deliver the Deloitte Global TMT predictions featuring Duncan Stewart. Always a super engaging, interesting uh, conversation and presentation of, of uh, some pretty deep research. It's also going to be the return to in-person for VEF. So it will be a hybrid event. Um, so there'll be some, there'll be room for people to attend in person, and we will, of course, maintain the stream for those who prefer to be virtual. So details on that are coming very soon, but please do save the date, January 18th. Okay, so again, thanks to those completing the feedback. Um, we'll close that poll momentarily. Uh, we are doing some virtual networking. I believe Judy and Eric for a little bit can stay and hang out in some of the rooms. So if you have any follow-up questions, particularly for Eric and Judy, uh, please do look for them. We will randomly put you into a breakout room. You do have the option to change rooms at any time. If you do not know how to do that, you have to really squint your eyes and read these instructions. Uh, but basically you should find a breakout room uh, button on Zoom, and that'll take you to the list of rooms and who's in what room. And all you have to do is highlight the room and, and say you want to move there. And then you can move there. So start in one room, move around, do your best to uh, virtually uh, rub shoulders. So we will end the poll here and uh, we are going to open the room. So for those who need to leave, thank you for joining us and uh, wishing you all a great holiday season. And for those who are gonna stick around, um, we'll have the rooms open till about 5.30 or so. Or if you have to leave early, feel free to go ahead. All right, thanks everybody. <laughs>